All right, welcome to the 23rd of, what month is it? 2020, <laughs> wait, no, September. <sighs> this is the Microsoft Dev Sync. Okay, so, <laughs> yes, we are somewhere in the middle of 2020, um, and uh, earlier this week we had planned an extra large sprint for ourselves for the next two weeks. Um, have you guys had any uh, Follow on thoughts to that. Uh, um, any, any decisions to uh, uh, pare down the expected amount of work that we're going to get done uh, in the next two weeks? Uh, I'd like to hear about that. Um, but uh, let's just go around and, uh, and hear what you've been up to and if you've got any uh, any relevant updates. So uh, let's start with Kiss. Well, I've only added a couple of tickets since we <laughs> made the enormous sprint. <laughs> Super size sprint. <laughs> um, yeah, I just uh, added, obviously, the, the Wolfram Alpha API um, went down, uh, which we're still chasing up. Um, yeah, OK. I have a meeting uh, tomorrow morning. Cool. Um, but it's not it's not a Spotify situation, just so the community knows. Like, well, presumably we'll see you tomorrow. Um, anyway, I've disabled the the um, tests that rely on that to pass, so that our CI processes don't all fail. Um, we got a good response from the the Mark II update uh, that went out yesterday. Um, so yeah, there's a some good comments and a few questions and stuff. Um, there's even questions about whether the people can can buy a, an early SJ two hundred one uh, if they depending on what the price is. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> thanks to Ken for reviewing the refactor intent service PR. That's now in um, and working on a few other things that don't really need discussion. Uh, uh, and the roadmap, actually, the roadmap's worth mentioning. I've started, so I started tidying up the, the um, brainstorm notes that we, that we uh, put together um, into a publicly available, into what will be a publicly available document. Um, uh, but for, um, for projects that are actually a repo like Microsoft Core, um, I thought that we should, you know, use my idea is that we use uh, the project boards, which are, you know, I think Kanban board in inside GitHub, um, to to kind of have that as a, a live process that is actually part of the workflow. Um, the benefit, a big benefit being, it can help me actually know which PRs should be getting our attention next and which ones are, you know, next down the line and then which ones can can wait because, you know, they might be good, but they're just not, um, uh, they're not on the roadmap or, you know, they're, they're not quite ready. Um, anyway, so I've started, I've, I've started doing that on Microsoft Core now. Um, there's, there's still only a handful of, of cards in there, but um, I want to kind of get through the, the backlog and categorize everything so that, um, yeah, can have a better idea of, <laughs> of where we're at. Um, and it's also prompted me to close a whole bunch of old tickets, which is very useful. Um, one, the one other thing that I want to get to pretty uh, early this week is um, exposing the, the micro logs from the Voight Conf CI test. So at the moment, you know, if something goes wrong that we can't replicate locally, um, there's not a there's not an easy way to figure out what's going on on that remote system. Um, and we at the moment we we blow away the the micro logs. We take the the Voight Conf output, but we don't keep the logs. So I want to have a look at how we um, how we can grab those, um, which should help us figure out some of these. Uh, yeah, CI bugs that we're seeing that we just haven't been able to replicate. 
on any local machine. So that's me. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, I, I've been noticing a lot of activity in terms of uh, responding to old PRs and, and things like that. So um, do you have an estimate of the, how much of a backlog you still have to go through? Let's, let's do it in mm -hmm. is it small, medium, or large? Uh, I would say <laughs> medium to large. Um, I mean, I think that, I think the biggest issue is that there's a number of pretty big PRs that could that could really do with some actual review, um, and so it's yeah. I think there'll I think there'll be plenty more um, that are you know something isn't working, and then someone replied, and then the original user never never responded, and so those we can those we can close up. So there's probably like hundreds of of tickets that are out there. Um, I I doubt that we're that I reckon we'd certainly be under a thousand um, by by a margin. Okay. <laughs> but but yeah, I think I think there's I think there's a fair bit of reviewing we could do. We could just spend multiple sprints reviewing PRs and still not get to the end of it. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> well, you know, that, that, I mean, yeah, so we've known that. I guess I'm, I'm asking more for the community's uh, sake so that they kind of have some expectations to, you know, what our process is and when we think we might get caught up and into a more sort of uh, workflow that we consider to be uh, sustainable, right? So I think we're probably, uh, oh, Chris is frozen. Uh, so I think. Uh, I missed everything you just said, sorry. You missed everything. OK, great. So I, I was uh, in large part asking for the community's benefit um, so that they can get an expectation as to when we you know, might get to into a steady state where you know, new PRs incoming get classified very, you know, fairly quickly and put into the bucket of, OK, well, we're going to you know, address this right away versus uh, oh, here's where it is on our roadmap, you know, to, to work on this kind of thing. So it seems like we're, you know, at least uh, three months, probably maybe five, from being caught up. Uh, is that uh, is that a fair guess? Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Um, I mean, I've, like because you know, there's there's the hours that are <laughs> like three years old, um, and. You know, we could take the approach of the the first PR gets the first review, but um, that means that the newest PRs are not going to get reviewed for for five months, and they're the ones that are actually, you know, based off our current code base and and are more likely to get merged. So I'm trying to sort of take a middle ground where where we we maintain try and maintain what's coming in now um, and and slowly deal with the backlog. So. Okay. Uh, and do you feel like you're making progress with respect to the, the size of the backlog? Is it is it getting smaller, or is are you treading water at this point? I mean, this might be a problem that we don't solve until we have more developers. To be honest, I think I'm treading water, and okay. um, my focus is on getting some structure around the backlog, okay. so that we That's can great. understand the backlog better. Okay. That's great. It's good to know. Thanks. Chris Bear. You may speak. OK, sorry. I had a trouble finding the mute button. So um, I finished the code for the, uh, for to get all the precise database uh, converted over, at least for the tables we have now. Um, I ran into two issues as I did it, and basically I'm building separate files for those, and we'll re address them later. Um, one is uh, a file that's in the database, but it's not on the precise server, so I've got a list of those. And um, the other one is not all the files have the same naming convention, so I'm taking the um, the most prevalent naming convention and doing all of the conversions for those. And, and then I'll have to reattack the other naming convention um, in a separate pass. Um, 
I'm running it on my personal database right now just to make sure everything is smooth. It takes about, it takes a while because I need to go out to the precise server and um, look and make sure that file exists before I actually put it on the database so that we don't have you know, dead records. Um, so it takes about 10 minutes per thousand records to run it. And there's about a million of them on the database. Um, so yeah, it'll, I'll, I'll probably just be like, you know, I'll run this thing, start off a job that does a bunch of like 10,000 of them or something and go do something else while it runs, um, you know, for the, for the next couple of days and see how far um, we get. Um, so what I, what I actually, what I want to do is after I'm comfortable with it on my machine, um, I'm, I would like to get the next version of Selene out because then I can put the next version of Selene on test and put this data on test so that, you know, Ken can make sure that it, you know, does what he needs it to do. Um, and then we can move to production, but, um, so yeah, that's where I am with the, uh, with the conversion code that's moving along. And while that runs, I, I just pulled the, um, upgrade Selene UI to Angular 10 um, ticket into in progress. So I'll be working on that um, while these run. That's a prerequisite really to getting any of the Tagger UI work done. Um, and we'll hopefully clean up some of the issues we're having in GitHub with in unsecured or risky or um, deprecated libraries <laughs> that we've been getting. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's me. Oh, and I have, I have my, my, uh, laser cut SJ201 now, thanks to Mr. Derek. So, um, something else I may spend an extra time, extra cycle on is, is, you know, getting an image plugged in there and, um, seeing if I can get it to boot and stuff. Okay, great. Um, just a quick back of the envelope calculation tells me it's going to take seven straight days of runtime for you to complete your your process at that rate. So I don't know if that's uh, reasonable um, or if uh, you might need to come up with a better algorithm. I'll figure <laughs> that out. Yeah, it, it's, it's a quick, it's really just a Python notebook. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, might, I might do something. I, the only one thing I think when I speed it up is if I just, you know, downloaded a, a listing of all the files in, in a, on a precise server and compare it against that in memory instead of going out to the precise server every single time. Um, I have a file that would probably speed things up quite a bit. So. Okay. Well, if it becomes a bottleneck, then I guess don't look at it. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. It's just wasting time, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not slowing anything else down, really, as of, as of yet. Do you have a clear direction as to what you're going to do with your SJ201 Mark II? Um, you're going to try to get an image running on it. Um, it shouldn't really be much different than any other image. Um, do you have any, any other specific tasks that you're going to work on? Uh, no, I was just going to try to get it running. Um, I don't think I have any anything assigned to me regarding that. So um, I just wanted to get it running. So if I did get something assigned to me, I would be able to use it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Ken. All right. Well, I didn't write my notes down, so if I miss some things, forgive me. Um, my short-term memory is not what it once was. Oh, hey. Uh, but uh, that I was... have this really cool new system that we just uh, started using about a year ago called Jira. It's, uh, it's got all the notes in it for you. <laughs> Well, at my age, we wear shirts with pockets and put a little notepad there, and that kind of handles it, too. But, uh, yeah, so, all right, let me think. Uh, first of all, Chris V., the, um, there is not only the, it is not only the case that there are files in the database which don't exist on the file system. It is the case that there are 540,000 files on the file system that don't exist in the database. Just an FYI. Uh, okay, so that being said, so that might be a good another good reason to download the file system contents and do a memory somehow, and then have a list of things that didn't get matched up. You know, 
Okay. Um, anyway, so what I've been working on um, is a variety of things. The first is a couple of pull requests uh, that, that I reviewed. Those are done. Um, I got my SJ201 dual driver setup, but my question is, because Chris said this while we were talking before this meeting, um, we were going over what I'm going to discuss in a minute. Am I to understand that this device will not work unless I use the amplifier because the amplifier on the SJ201 I have is not working? The amplifier on the SJ201 that you have does work. It just is very, very poor as an amplifier because of the capacitor swap. Um, so it will work, but it may will not be very loud and the quality will be poor. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So I don't need the external amplifier on this jig to get it working. That's good to know. Okay. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned at the last meeting, I got the enclosure code classes done and I started integration into core and um, yeah, so it's fugly. Uh, what happened was that the low level GPIO stuff requires pseudo privileges to run, but and so we really don't do that. And so I hacked start to um, make enclosure run as root, which of course didn't work because all the code was in the skill. I did not <laughs> want to make skills run as root. So I pulled the uh, stuff out of there and put it into enclosure. The problem is that when enclosure runs as root, it barks, it has some issues. Uh, and those um, are there's a variety of those, but not the least of which is our architecture causes it to be super classed by code that isn't running as root. And that's bad and needs to be refactored as well at some point. My initial intent um, was to clean it up and refactor it and get everything nice and neat. But my fallback was always I can brute force it if I have to to get it working. And so after burning a day and a half of realizing I'm not going to be able to do this elegantly, I am now working on getting it working in a brutish manner. So it is actually calling out with a Python OS system command that says sudo Python three, run this script that does specifically the function I need. Uh, obviously not um, an elegant solution and something I would like but we'll get the job done because most of what we're doing is not time sensitive anyway, turning up the volume, reading the switches, whatever. And as I was mentioning, when the meeting started, this kind of puts a damper on being able to have users hook into the callbacks for the buttons. Um, that being said, um, it's okay since they have dedicated functions right now anyway, they're indeed printed on the or etched on the board. So I will make those work as advertised. This button will do volume up, this one will do volume down, etc. And we'll deal with the ramifications of ugly code downstream as has it seems been the case in the past. Okay. So that's where I'm at. Okay. I should have this running <coughs> with doing volume, handling LEDs, handling the buttons by our next meeting on Friday. Great. Great. I think I can't, I can't get, I couldn't get, yeah, I couldn't get my new um, Mark II working because I didn't get a SD card when it was shipped and um, that is going to be here hopefully by tomorrow or Friday. So once I get that, I will flash the boot image so that I can convert it to boot off of USB and then I'll burn the image on the USB card and boot off of that. Okay, great. So um, I need to involve you and Derek, myself, and Kevin in a discussion about the next spin on the SJ201 board uh, for reasons which I will get into when it's my turn. Uh, all right, uh, Derek. Hey, all right. So, yeah, um, Chris mentioned earlier I got him his device yesterday. And I did make a little tweak to it. I threw on uh, the back of the um, uh, the acoustic chamber. I threw on the amplifier that we were using on the off-the-shelf design uh, to drive that 
audio chamber from the line out. Yeah, I went ahead and tested it and actually worked pretty well. Um, just as a kind of band-aid until we can get past the amp. So if we, um, actually one of the SJ201s, the, the amp was not working at all uh, internally, which I suspect had to do with um, that, that uh, capacitor switch. So this allows Chris's device to play, play stuff. And I think I might actually just have that on all of them that we're doing for this first round as a, um, a way to, if need be, test the acoustic chamber. Um, I like to just have ways to isolate the systems and say, okay, is this thing actually working? So, um, so I did kind of take a pause from printing the, um, the, the first 3D printed version for a variety of reasons. One, um, Michael might get into in a, in a minute, but the other reason is uh, I kind of bumped up in priority getting the SJ230, uh, the SJ230, which is the laser cut designs for um, parts for Michael and Gaz. So I got those on the printer and the laser cut uh, stuff, which should be done in, by the end of the week. Um, so we'll be ready to, to send those out when we have boards to accompany them. Um, and other than that, I've been uh, today mostly wrapping up uh, where we left off with the GUI tagger. A um, couple of things outstanding there, especially around how to get to it, where it's going to kind of live in the uh, navigation. And um, hopefully I'll have that actually done by the end of, the, end of today. Um, so that I'm not blocking Chris. Um, yeah, so that's that's where I'm at. No new tickets. <laughs> I've not added any new tickets. All right. Um, okay, great. So uh, for myself, I actually got to get my fingers a little bit into the hardware uh, debugging uh, yesterday. <clears throat> I had a short call with Kevin, and we were able to figure out the um, one of the audio problems he was having. Uh, so XMOS uh, released a firmware update at the end of July uh, that we had been waiting for when we started this project. And um, the upshot of that firmware, now that we've tested it and know how it works, is that it may allow us to greatly simplify the SJ201 design. We can theoretically take two ICs off the board and use instead of using any GPIO at all, we may be able to use the uh, DSI interface for LCDs, which would be allow us to use a good quality LCD that's a lot, lot cheaper than the MIPI interface ones that uh, we've been planning. All told, it might save us as much as 25 bucks on the, the bomb, um, which would be really awesome. Uh, so it probably won't quite save us that much. But uh, this causes a couple of issues. Um, one, uh, we might not be able to have the fancy 12 LEDs uh, that we have in the current design, um, just because of the, the GPIO constraints uh, coming out of the XMOS chip. Uh, it has eight GPIO, but unless we can figure out a way to write our own custom firmware for controlling those, um, they'll be restricted to fairly simple operations that we can do. Um, there's no reason why we can't write our own firmware, but it's going to be a question of bandwidth. So maybe we'll be able to come up with a compromise where uh, we can come up with uh, a design that allows us to do something now and upgrade it in the future with, with just firmware. So um, I'll be talking with Kevin about that. Um, but it greatly simplifies the audio data path. So the audio data will go out of, uh, well, basically, it'll be all USB driven. There'll be no other interface to the board. You'll send uh, audio through uh, the USB uh, directly to the XMOS chip. Um, which will then send I2S output to the amplifier, uh, which um, you know is uh, is this, it's as simple as it could possibly be. So we don't have to have dual audio streams, one going to the XMOS chip and one going to the amplifier, anything like that. Um, that's our goal. Um, whether we'll actually be able to get there is going to require some experimentation, um, and um, and so it also might be a little bit of a step backwards in terms of progress on the SJ201. So what I need to have a, a discussion with, uh, you know, with 
you know, with Derek and Ken and, um, and uh, probably Josh and myself to decide, you know, what path do we want to take forward? Do we want to get the prototype boards out as soon as possible? Or do we want to try to get it out in a manner that's going to be uh, more cost effective? And the difference probably in the long run isn't that great. Um, but, you know, we're in a stage right now where, you know, every couple of weeks is, is, is critical, right? So um, uh, we might end up actually doing both. So we'll see. Uh, but, um, but so that's the update on the hardware. It's, uh, I think it's, um, it's really helpful. Um, literally every part of the system now works. It's just a matter of getting them to all work on one board at the same time, uh, which, uh, you know, Kevin is working on. So um, the audio analysis, just so everyone knows, it's a really simple fix. You just, you know, uh, Kevin now has the proper capacitors in stock, so he can just uh, resolder those fairly uh, readily. If we need to have those amplifiers fixed for any kind of testing that we're doing now, uh, just let me know, and you know we'll, we can send those back boards back to Kevin for his work, and we can have you know, uh, the amplifiers working well uh, for testing the audio chamber and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, I don't. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say I don't think that's the highest priority right now. I think that, um, yeah, if we need to decide what which way we're gonna go in terms of prototyping the next round. I think that's the, the higher priority. I think what we've got now to work with the amp will work for, for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> okay, great. So, but yeah, my biggest thing for me is that the sooner we can get to all of us having the exact same thing on our desks, the better. <laughs> so, I mean, like right now, Ken had you know, something very rigged up, and, and I've got something kind of rigged up. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's sort of the trouble with the, this prototype stage, right? Is everyone is sort of a unique uh, a device. Um, so here's my question for you guys: uh, Would it be useful to uh, save two to four weeks, or maybe two weeks and maybe four weeks, uh, in terms of getting an SJ two hundred one that does work that has all the functions built in, so that you can start writing software for it? Um, or uh, knowing, well, I guess knowing that in uh, two or four weeks, we'll have another version, which is not really software compatible in the sense that um, right now, the, you know, the, the data path works one way and then the data path will work in a, in a different way. So uh, in fact, you know, the interrupts will be different um, and, uh, you know, the I2C control will be different. And so there'll be a number of different differences at that sort of low level. Um, is it useful to continue developing on you know the current system, knowing that those changes will happen, um, or would you rather, uh, you know, would it be more useful to spend your time on something else while we're waiting for those changes? To happen? I so, twice personally, but <laughs> so if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, <clears throat> all that would change is. Pin 22 becomes pin 47. Uh, the I2C uh, channel is nine instead of seven uh, ad nauseum. I mean, that's just configuration. So well, it's more like it's not. It's more like it's more like this. Instead of using any of the Raspberry Pi's I2C pins or PPIO pins, you'll be sending USB commands which will then control an I2C master controller on the XMOS chip. So it will have an I2C bus that will communicate with other parts. And so, you know, software-wise, you know, it's not really that difficult, right? Uh, to send USB commands. Is no, 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 I get that, but that's... But it's yeah. a different kind. Uh, the major change that, and this is something where I think we need to talk about it, uh, and this is why I want to talk about this potential change um, with, you know, with software and, uh, and hardware at the same time is that um, in this proposed new revision, we won't have any actual interrupts coming in. And so as Ken, you found out, you figure out how to do interrupts through Raspberry Pi and that sort of thing. But you're, you are running into some um, you know, system level privilege stuff, right? Um, using this new data path, all of your interrupts would be coming over the USB bus. And I don't actually know how this works, I, but I, you know, from the documentation that I've read, uh, defining a, um, a, uh, 
a, a, I think a personal interface device um, as, a, as a type of thing that's on the USB bus um, can generate interrupt. So like, you know, it's a, it's a keyboard, right? It generates an interrupt when the user presses a key, that sort of thing. So that's the kind of device that, uh, that's the sort of behavior we'd be looking to use uh, with this new data path. Because when a person pressed a button, it would generate an interrupt, you know, via the USB. So kind of like USB interrupts is the thing we would have to learn. How to learn. Well, no, so, so, I mean, just from a high level where you're heading there is we're going to have to write a device driver for the device. Um, a Linux device driver. There's no other way around it when you go to that level. But that's not what I'm concerned about. So, um, or really that, that's a big issue. Uh, reading between the lines of what you said, am I under the, am I correct in the assumption that we will have access to the firmware source code that runs on the XMOS chip? That is unclear. Then how will we do all of these things? Also unclear. Oh no, well, that's not unclear. Uh, the, the current firmware that they give us has a pretty well documented interface for controlling the eight GPIO pins and an I2C master controller that they've implemented in inside firmware within the device. Right. So we don't have to. Where is that document? Where is that document? I'll send you a link. Because um, if that's not the VF control it is, uh, but it's file. Nice on what you might Okay, um, and that is a C program, by the way, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, again, that's going to require a device driver for us to develop for our own hardware, which is not impossible. I've done it. Um, I've done filter drivers and Linux device drivers before. Um, it's it's just it's disappointing because what we have now shows up as basically a sound card, a generic sound card. And access to the additional functionality is through well understood PI means, which is GPIO and I2C. Um, in, in this new approach, it's going to require a device driver because all of that's going to have to go through a uh, interface that's going to convert the commands. The, there's going to be one interrupt coming from the card that's going to say, here's USB data. And then you're going to have to figure out is that mic input? Is that no, no, GPIO? No, no. It doesn't change the um, the audio data path. It still shows up as a sound card. The, the XMOS chip implements a USB 1.0 compliant sound card. So for audio input output, you can just use regular uh, sound card drivers. Correct, but the problem is, is correct, <laughs> but the problem is that current sound cards don't generate interrupts for buttons. Oh, it's a separate so device. It's not the sound card device. It, it shows up as multiple devices on the USB bus. Oh, it's going to show up as multiple devices, kind of like the uh, microphone and the output. Exactly. Multiple USB devices, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look into what that's going to take. Um, but it is going to be some heavy lifting. That being said, um, did, did Kevin take a look at the switch code that I sent him? to determine the initial latch up problem? Or was he too busy with the sound stuff? I don't know, we'll have to ask him. The reason I ask is because if we decide we need pull downs on those switches, then that would be something we would want to incorporate before the next revision of boards. Yes. And then that dovetails nicely into project <laughs> rollover. I always want to say overlord, project rollover who is patiently awaiting us to replace their non-functioning hardware with working hardware. And what does this decision do to that timeline? Right, that's a, that's a good consideration as well. So there's an intermediate path where we don't, um, uh, we don't eliminate the two ICs that we have on the board and uh, which doesn't enable us to use the, the DPI interface uh, but it allows us to continue using the software as we're using, writing it now. It, it'll we'll continue to use the um, the GPIO for interrupts and for like control review and that sort of thing. But uh, it will basically fix the data path so that we only uh, output one audio stream to the next mm -hmm. and it feeds it into the, uh, the sound card that we're using now. Uh, for is, the, is, is the significant 
benefit in the bill of materials cost realized by the replacement of the lead drivers? Is that the primary cost factor there? No, it's, it's there's, uh, basically we're using a USB hub chip and a USB sound card chip and an amplifier chip. So we've got those three chips. When in the fully optimal setup, oh, yeah, you could eliminate the sound card and then you just have an amp left over. Well, yeah, maybe. Um, it's not clear to me. That's what... something that you know, we'll work, uh, the, you know, Kevin and I have a plan for, you know, testing out and making sure that that actually is the case. Okay. Okay. Um, and did you discuss with him anything about the um, potential capacitance issue on these switches? No. Uh, I'm going to take a, uh, a note here to uh, discuss that with him now. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. Um, intermediate paths tend to be annoying because, you know, we already have like a version of our image that works with the re-speaker <laughs> and now we're getting one for the SJ201 and then it'll be SJ201 alpha, SJ201 beta, and then SJ201 final. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm flexible either way. I'm just concerned about the account and what the ramifications are regarding their, their hardware because if I get it back and it's what I think it is, which is it's not really dead in the water, it's just dead to audio, which makes it seem like it's dead in the water, then I can certainly reflash it and it'll work until the next time it doesn't and then they'll be back in the same situation. Whereas I really haven't seen that annoying behavior out of the SJ201. Um, so that's my concern is turning something around that's going to, within a week, exhibit the same behavior versus something that hopefully that would go away. So that, that would be my only input on that. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing um, on the hardware side phys physically is the switch from the DSI to the DPI interface really is kind of interesting. If, if we're no longer interfacing the GPIO for the SJ201 itself um, and you know freeing that up to drive the display, the whole orientation kind of might need to be rethought a little bit. Um, not a lot, I don't think, but uh, a little bit. Um, we also are going to need a board to convert that uh, kind of bulky um, 2 by 20 40 pin GPIO to uh, you know a thin um, FPC style connector that's actually on the display. Um, <clears throat> which actually could be on the SJ201, but you know, that starts to get kind of complicated. So I don't know. Yeah, it could just be a cable too. Well, yeah, it would, it could be, I guess. Yeah, it, it could be. Um, yeah, and then we'd be using just, uh, we would need the I2C on the um, Raspberry Pi for the touch input. Because right now that's all going through the DSI. I was going to say, otherwise, why would we even need that connector? But yeah, I didn't think about the touch input. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, yeah. So yeah. It's, a, it's not. As, it's not as easy as it, as it might look at first glance. So well, we might, you know, we might end up not with necessarily cost savings, but at least we'll have a, a clear data path. So. Well, there so. there is a big cost savings potentially because. So from what I understand, most of the displays we've looked at, even these wave share displays, which you guys all have, you know, in your devices, is powered by DSI. Um, but really, the display itself is an RGB display, which uh, the board on the back of that display is converting the DSI MIPI interface to RGB. So really, if you're getting rid of the middleman, you're getting rid of the converter board, and now you're able to talk to display uh, kind of in its native thing to a certain degree, um, that, that kind of halves the cost of the display because now you're not buying the, the converter board. You're really just buying, um, I mean, you're just getting the, the interfaces to made up correctly. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so that could save, that could be on the half of the cost of the display. It could, yeah. It depends on the cost and the, uh, uh, the capacity. 
touching your face. However, yeah. I see to do that for you and turn into the learning your device. Your device. Um, at which point now we're talking about maybe we need to have that USB hub chip back on the board because we've got two actual right. physical devices. So yeah, it's there's, there's a lot of decisions we have to go through. So. Michael, Michael, I, and I realize it's complicated, but that's why we make the big <laughs> bucks. But is it is it possible that it would be smarter to continue along the path we're currently going to reach completion with the existing hardware, recognizing it's a gazillion dollars too much, but that downstream, it could be completely redesigned to be half price and get this out and working into several sets of users' hands, rollover being one, maybe even dev kit, uh, Kickstarter people too, with the belief that six months downstream, we will have an entirely new SJ01 board that completely is different than what we've produced, yet we have met some obligations in a reasonable amount of time before that. Because the only reason I ask is the best laid plan. So we, we, know, we think we know we're gonna be able to decrease price by getting rid of this chip and getting rid of this chip and replacing the display and doing, but those often don't work out as intended. And so there's delays. And rather than causing all the people that are relying on us or waiting on us to buy into those delays, maybe we could give them something we have now as an interim solution, knowing that in six months it's going to become, I hate the word, deprecated. Well, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, what we're working on now is intended to be a dev kit. So we're relatively price insensitive. Um, my hope is that we could then, you know, quickly turn this into a consumer ready device simply by, you know, upping the quantities. That would be, that would be the ideal situation. But you're correct. You know, if, um, if we want to get the, the least um, risky path to getting developer units out there quickly, then yeah, we should go with the known solution, uh, even if it's you know a little bit more expensive. Um, the the catch there though is, as you said, um, we're going to end up with two different pieces of hardware out there in the field, which means that we're going to have to support different firmwares and that sort of thing. Not that big a deal because the differences are pretty minute, um, but uh, but there is a difference, and you know that will be great practice for us supporting multiple different kinds of hardware. Um, but is that really you know the thing we want to take on at this stage? So. One might argue it's not much different than the fact that we have a Mark I uh, artifact that we still have to kind of support. The benefit of that approach, though, is that the dev kits get into people's hands outside of this group, and any kind of feedback regarding chamber issues, driver issues, poor quality components could be surfaced before we actually do a power buy. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think my biggest concern would be uh, something like the re-speaker issue. Whereas, you know, the, the design that is intended to be deprecated has a thing about it that just nags at us and takes a lot of our time that we keep can't get quite past, kind of like the, the re-speaker audio issue. When we're, we know that we're gonna not be needing it long-term anyway. <clears throat> oh yeah, like the, the software bug. Yeah, back. Yeah. Well, for what, it's, for what it's worth, though, I've been running the SJ201 for several weeks now, and I have not seen any showstoppers. Okay. But um, that's antidotal at best, right? Okay. Well, yeah. this is a great discussion. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll noodle on this for a little bit, and um, let's uh, put something on the schedule for. Well, ideally, and maybe just a little bit, maybe we can grab Kevin and have a discussion about this if you guys are available. Otherwise, let's put something on the calendar for tomorrow because um, I'd like to hash this out quickly and, uh, and get the next spin going. I hate, I hate doing this, but it, it's you guys know me already. So what's the intention of the LEDs regarding directionality, if any? No, because you mentioned we might go with less than 12 LEDs. We currently have 12 LEDs configured in a circle where the prior re-speaker codes would use the far field microphones to indicate where the input direction was coming from. And I'm wondering if that was our intended usage of these LEDs. And if so, then how having less LEDs would 
impact yeah. that. And that's just that's there. something that we didn't revisit when uh, on the, the chip changed out from underneath us. So you're correct. The, the original intent was to use them as a directionality indicator. Um, but when XMOS deprecated the chip that we were going to use and pointed us to this new chip, uh, we didn't change that that design aspect, uh, you know, even though this new chip does not give us a directionality information. So it's kind of a holdover from that other design. So, you know, I think we it's, it's tempting to say, well, I want to keep that feature because it's cool, but like, what does it really do for us? You know, I think, you know, we, we might want to think about that. Yeah. On a device that didn't have a screen, it would use this board, you know, and that's essentially the same hardware, except you literally just take the screen off. And then the, the LEDs are your, your main interface option. So, you know, it could spin for loading, uh, change colors for, you know, different states, uh, all kinds of different things like that. Um, don't need 12 necessarily to do that, uh, but that was also the other um, use case. Yeah, so Is that's something for you to think about in terms of the, you know, the human interface factors, you know, uh, what do we need, what are the requirements for, for those LEDs as an interface? Um, because, you know, we might be able to get a, we might be able to easily add four, right? Um, right. But uh, that doesn't give us, you know, a ring sort of architecture. Maybe it's a bar that goes back and forth or, you know, uh, but, um, but yeah, it's something, something to think about um, you know, in terms of you know, having a potential restrictor there. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks again for the discussion there. Uh, it's been some, some good, good things to think about. Um, is there any other issues that we can discuss? Or? Just regarding any last minute meetings tomorrow, I'll be in and out. I have to, I'm waiting for packages here because uh, I don't want them to float away if I'm not here. Uh, but I have to take my wife down to a dealer by the by the condo, drop her off, I get the car worked on, drop her back at the condo, come back up here, and then four hours later go back. So please give me more than a five or 10 minute head up heads up uh, regarding any last minute okay. meeting. That's we'll, we'll take care of that. Uh, Okay. Anybody else have issues, concerns? I know we all have issues. But nothing we want to talk about right now. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see Bye -bye. you on Friday. Okay. Go team.